Brother Tucker's 100th birthday. It's my understanding that her sisters and other family members are here. If you could please stand, we just want to acknowledge you. Amen. Amen. Thank you. We love you, Mother Tucker. Amen. All right. If we continue standing and grab our Bibles or look to the screen for the reading of God's Word today, we coming from Ephesians chapter 5, verses 22 through 33. A very familiar passage. And it reads, Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is head of the wife, as also Christ is head of the church. And he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church. And gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. So husbands ought to love their wives, love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. So no one ever, for no one ever hated his own flesh but nourishes and cherishes it, just as the Lord does the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let each one of you in particular so love his own wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. You may be seated. If I had to put a tag to this text this morning, it would be titled, Givers and Takers. Some people may believe, thinking that this sermon does not apply to me because I am not married. For those here who are not married and hope to be someday, this message is preparatory to help you approach marriage with the right expectations. For those who are married, it will show us how to have an even better marriage. For everyone else, it will give you something to pray for and how to support the marriages you see around you. I'm not sure why in this culture that we live in that we Christians are prone to follow the habits of the world and remain single for long periods of time. For that is a worldly thing to do. Taking time, taking people who should be married and having them try to survive as single people when they are wired, hardwired in some cases. To be married, your single should be as short as possible. Come on, Come on. Yeah. Once you take the wife once, your engagement should be as brief as possible. The key word being. Date or single should date with marriage as their goal, not the hookup. That's the world's way of dating. Now, don't get me wrong. There are some people who have the gift of singleness, like the Apostle Paul, who have a, a unique spiritual capacity to remain single for the purpose of serving the Lord. Unless you have that gift, and it's been clearly defined for you by having no desire at all to be married, then you need to be married. Not dating, not going out, not having sleepovers, <laughs> but married. Otherwise, you're going to be tempted and sin. In other words, if you are shacking up, you need to stop playing house and get married. If you're not ready to get married, then you need to stop playing house. When a man says to you as a woman, I love you and I want to sleep with you. That's not love. 
run from that man. The same would be true on the other side. If a woman says to a man, I love you and I want you to sleep with me, run, man, run. <laughs> That's not love either. In both cases, it's lust. Love purifies and does not lead into sin. As we move into a breakdown of our text, let me start by saying there are two types of people in the world, givers and takers. So when two people come together in marriage, there are three possible outcomes. When two givers come together, their marriage flourishes because they are selfless and their concern is not for themselves but for their spouse, as God said it should be. They have submitted to one another and follow the guidance given in our passage of text today. When a giver and a taker come together, the marriage is very frustrating as one gives and the other takes as if they are entitled to what they are receiving from their spouse and never looking past their own needs. This is a picture of being unequally yoked. When two takers come together, you better watch out. This is all about fulfilling individual desires. This is not about us. This is about me. These relationships are very destructive as they are only concerned with what one can get for themselves. Our passage today is going to reveal God's intention or his plan on how husbands and wives should relate to one another, the role of wives and husbands, and finally, how those roles should be carried out. Sisters, we're coming down your street first. But rest assured, the brothers will get their turn too. So why is it when everyone, I mean everyone, men and women, read this passage, they stop at verse 22? If we're lucky, we may make it to verse 24 before arguments and discussions start over the word submit. Many of today's women see the word that invokes slavery. And men see it as a way to get what they want. And that is very true if you take the passage out of context. Right. Brothers and sisters, we have to be very careful when we look at Scripture or when someone is quoting Scripture to us because we have to make sure that we are not taking or receiving it out of context. Just like the word context is spelled C-O-N-T-E-X-T. -E if we take T-E-X-T -E out, what are we left with? Con. It's a con. <laughs> They're setting you up. So in order to get the context of this passage, we need to go to verse 18 and read through verse 21. And do not be drunk with wine, in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another in the fear of God. Saints, there are two key phrases in this passage. To be filled with the Spirit, in verse 18, and submitting to one another in the fear of God, which is verse 21 in its entirety. We as Christians are to be filled with the Spirit. Evidence that we are filled with the Spirit is given in verses 19 and 20 in how we speak to one another and how we should be giving thanks to God the Father for all things. Some would call that worship. And then submitting to one another. This is how we relate to one another regardless of our marital status. Brothers and sisters, this is the foundation for all relationships. Verses 22 through 33 specifically speak on how wives and husbands should relate to each other. If we were to continue in the book and go to chapter 6, we would see how parents are to relate to their children and vice versa. And as well as seeing slaves, how they relate to the masters, or today's words, employers and employees. We are to be submissive in all relationships, both of us, men and women. So now that we know that we are to be submissive to one another, let us define what it means to submit. 
But first, let us define what submission is not. Submission does not mean to obey. If God wanted wives to obey their husbands, he would have had Paul write, obey. But he didn't. He said, submit. So any husband that goes around telling his wife that she has to obey because that's what the Bible says is misguided. Or they're setting you up for the con. Because they're taking the text out of context. According to Merriam-Webster's dictionary, submit means to yield oneself to the authority or will of another. The Greek word for submit is huputasso. It's a compounded word. Hupo means under, and tasso means to arrange, to place in order. It's a military term. It means to place yourself under, to rank yourself under, as a general principle as Christians. We are to always live our lives under submission. This is hard to do if you're not filled with the Spirit. This is why we should not be unequally yoked. But even still, if you are, we as Christians are called to submit. Christian means to be Christ-like, right? Didn't Christ submit himself to the will of the Father in Luke 22 and 42? Jesus saying, Father, if it is your will, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done, but yours be done. The Lord of Lord and King of Kings is equally God as part of the triune God. But the Son is still under the submission of the Father. Wives, through your submission, you keep your house covered and may win a lost or wavered soul back to the Lord through your actions. Brothers and sisters, hear me and hear me well. Submission is a choice. Paul doesn't say, husband, tell your wives to submit. Or wives, tell your husbands to be the spiritual head of the household. No, instead he speaks to husbands and wives individually and asks each to work on their own attitudes. So true biblical submission comes from the person doing the submitting, not from the person being submitted to. Submission is not something that is demanded. It is something that is given. Philippians 2, 3, and 4 says, Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit. But in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interest, but also for the interest of others. So now, looking at verses 22 through 24 again, without getting hung up on the word submit, we can focus on what the rest of the passage has to say. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as also Christ is head of the church. And he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Now, this is completely out of the realm of the wife's nature or personality. <laughs> when a wife chooses not to follow the scripture to submit to her own husband as to the Lord, she is not only falling short as a wife, she is falling short as a follower of Jesus Christ. This means that a woman should take great care and how she chooses her husband. Yes, fella, she scoped you out before you saw her. Instead of looking for an attractive man, instead of looking for a wealthy man, instead of looking for a romantic man, you should be first looking for a man that you can respect. Again, mutual submission has already been established in Ephesians 5 and 21. The scripture didn't say wise Submit to every man, but to your own husbands. Not to every man, not to any man, but your own husbands. This has nothing to do with spiritual inferiority. There is no inferiority among believers, as Paul says in Galatians 3 and 28. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male or female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. This is the order that God has put in place. For the husband is the head of the wife, as also, as also Christ is head of the church. This is an illustration of submission as the church is under the authority of Christ. As stated in Genesis, 
the woman Eve, the wife of Adam, was created to help her husband. Again, submission does not mean inferiority. Also, submission does not mean silence. This is, there is a mission for the Christian marriage, and that mission is to glorify God. The wife says, I'm going to put myself under that mission. That mission is more important than my individual desires. I'm putting myself below the mission God has for our marriage and for my life. Husbands, don't take this out of context because authority does not mean rule. That's what a taker thinks. As I said, brothers, we'll be coming down your street in a minute. <laughs> authority here is better associated with headship or leadership, and with leadership comes responsibilities. For where there is no order or things are out of order, there is chaos. Now, let me say this about the role of a wife. There is this common misconception that a wife's or a woman's workplace is in the home. That is a lie. Planted by takers who want to control their wives and keep them under the misguided use of the scripture. It's just not true. Even the virtuous wife of Proverbs 31 had a side hustle. If we look at verse 16, she considers a field and buys it from her prophets she plants a vineyard. Yep, she was in the real estate. If you read all of Proverbs 31, you will see that her primary focus is her household, not necessarily her place of work, but the care of her home. If her side hustle interfered with her home, then she would let the side hustle go, not her home. As we can see in verse 11, the heart of her husband safely trusts her, so he will have no lack of gain. Therefore, husbands, we should consult with our wives to make better decisions. Hallelujah. And wives should consult with their husbands. But the final decision on any disagreements rests with the husband. That's right. And the wife should yield to that decision and trust in the Lord. That's right. Husbands, our wives can easily submit to us and our decisions if we do our part as described in verses 25 through 29 Amen. and take care of our responsibilities as the head. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. So husbands ought to lo love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as the Lord does the church. All right, brothers. Return to corner. And we are now on our street. <laughs> Starting to get a little hot. We, as husbands, are told to love our wives. To get the full meaning of this first verse, we must first understand what love means. There are four Greek words that could have been used to illustrate the type of love called for from husbands. There's eros, which which is where we get the word erotic from, a sexual, passionate type of love. Could have been used, but it wasn't. Filio or storge, which deal with brotherly and family types of love, were not used either. The only version of love that can illustrate the type of love that husbands are supposed to have for their wives is found in the Greek word agape, which is a selfless type of love, a sacrificial type of love of love. It's the type of love that Jesus had when he let them put him on that old rugged cross and died for our sins. It's the type of love that causes a man to get up in the middle of the night because his wife heard a noise to put her mind at ease. It's the type of love that causes a man to go to the store and buy feminine products. 
It's the type of love that causes a man to open the door for his wife. It's the type of love that causes a man to go up and down the stairs with a heavy load of laundry so his wife doesn't have to. It's the type of love that causes a man to go out when it's pouring down rain so she doesn't have to get wet. It's the type of love that causes a man to hit the pause button at the most crucial part of the game so that she can have a listening ear. I thank God every day for the pause button. Brothers and sisters, as the husband is called to make sacrifices for his wife. So verses 25 through 29 have three assignments that the husband has to carry out for his wife. He is to protect, proclaim, and provide. He is to protect, by his, protect his wife by putting her needs before his own. That sounds like a giver. As Christ did for the church who went so far as to die for his bride, he gave himself up. The spirit-filled husband loves his wife with a sacrificial love, agape love. The husband has to proclaim the word to his wife so that she can be purified with the word. Husbands, we have the responsibility to wash over our wives with the word of God, to provide a continual washing with the truth of Holy Scripture so that all stains are taken away. That sounds like a giver to me, too. The husband has to provide for her needs so that she may excel. The Apostle Paul says to give the same attention to your wives that you do to yourself because you really are one flesh. Because if you don't, you're only punishing yourself. The idea is to nourish and cherish your wife. Nourish, that means to provide what will bring life and growth and well-being. And cherish literally means to make warm. Warm. I guess you could sort of say, <laughs> to cuddle, to embrace, to provide security. And so that's, and so there's this idea of caring, meeting needs, and fulfilling desires. Think of your wife like a flower. She has to be cared for, fed, and watered. If that doesn't happen, how can she bear any fruit? Proverbs 18 and 22 says, He who finds a wife finds a good thing and attains favor from the Lord. Now hear me. Something is seriously wrong when a husband sees his wife as a source of provision for himself. Something is equally wrong when a husband sees his wife as a cook, a dishwasher, a babysitter, or just a physical partner. That's a taker. Husbands have to see their wives as a treasure to be cared for, to cherish, to nourish in the same way the Lord does his church. What Paul states in verses 30 and 31 are the justification for the husband's sacrifice. For there is no more individuality. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. The greatest expression of love is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 4 through 8. Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself. It is not puffed up, does not behave rudely, does not seek its own, is not provoked, thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endure all things. Love never fails. So brothers, love your wives sacrificially. Purifyingly, caringly, and permanently. Be absolutely unbreakable in your devotion and your commitment to your wives. Make a covenant 
with your wife that follows the pattern of the covenant Christ made with the church. Now, there's a motive behind all of this, and that's in verse 32, which is summarized in verse 33, the whole passage. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let each one of you in particular so, so love his own wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. What is a mystery? New revelation, something in the past hidden and now revealed. The mystery is this. This has never been said before in Holy Scripture. Never in the Old Testament that marriage is to follow the pattern of Christ's relationship to the church. Marriage is sacred, very sacred. The church is one with Christ. That's the mystery. The church is one with Christ, and that's the picture of marriage. It is sacred by the virtue of its association with the relationship between Christ and and his church. So in closing, marriage, marriages are under attack and have been since the beginning. The enemy knows that if he can destroy marriage or interrupt its purpose, it will not only affect today, but will affect tomorrow as well. Bad marriages are generational tragedies. They send children bruised and confused into the next generation and into their own marriages with all kind of wrong experiences, all kind of wrong ideas, and bitterness. When we follow God's plan and example of marriage, when both husbands and wives choose to become givers and not takers and fulfill their God-defined roles, what woman would not want to submit to her husband? As his goal through love is to protect her from every hurt, harm, and danger, to proclaim the word of God to her, to sanctify her and purify her and provide for her every need. If this is the husband's goal, every wife would help her husband to succeed in everything he does. She would respect her husband and not resist him. She would follow him and not feel the need to lead because she knows as her husband succeeds, she succeeds because they truly are one flesh. As my wife and I tell every couple we see, the goal of marriage is to be a walking and talking testimony. Without a word, our actions should reflect the love of Jesus Christ that he has for the church and the love that the church has for Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. May God continue to bless our souls. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.